Hello, welcome to the Friday, May 26th, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. And well, it's just barely a week after WannaCrypt, and we already have another important SMB vulnerability. Now, this one isn't quite as bad as the one that led to that famous ransomware worm outbreak, but still pretty bad if you are running Samba. Samba is the open source implementation of the SMB protocol, often found on Linux based systems. And the problem here is that that net hacker can that can upload a file to your system is then able to execute that file. So first of all, the attacker has to be able to upload a file, which typically means that the attacker needs credentials in order to accomplish that. So that's a little bit more of a hurdle than what we had with the WannaCrypt exploit that did not require any authentication. The bug is actually pretty simple here. In SMB, we have the opportunity to connect to named pipes. Now, if the named pipe is actually, if the name of that pipe contains a path, then that particular file is executed. So really what they forgot here is they forgot to check for the slash in the pipe name. And this is really what this patch does. All recent versions of Samba, meaning 3.5 and up, are vulnerable. Now, if you are a Windows shop and typically don't run Linux, then this may be less of interest to you. But remember, if you have any of these network storage devices like QNAP, Synology, and the like, they typically do use Samba in order to share files with Windows systems. So you may be affected. I've seen a patch from Synology, I haven't really looked at the the other manufacturers yet if they already came up with something. Billy Ross, who has looked at industrial control systems and medical devices before, has taken another look at pacemakers and associated equipment. In particular, he also looked at the devices used to program pacemakers or to monitor pacemakers in a patient's home. Well, uh, what he found is probably no big surprise to anybody who has looked at devices like this before. He found around 6,000 different vulnerabilities across the four devices that he looked at in more detail. And a big part of this, and again, no big surprise here, is due to all the third-party components, all the libraries that are being used in these devices. And that's uh, well uh, why he was able to so quickly identify so many devices. It was really just a matter of looking up the version of the library that was used in a particular device and then checking what vulnerabilities are known in this particular library. Of course, a patching of a system like this is quite tricky and often not done. Also, other issues, not just that you could possibly manipulate the pacemaker, but also patient data is stored unencrypted on some of the controllers used in uh, this particular system. Now, how do you get uh, these controllers? Turns out you can actually buy them on eBay. These devices are considered controlled devices and hospitals, doctors are supposed to return them to the manufacturer if they no longer use them. But needless to say, that doesn't always happen and it's not very well enforced. So the result is uh, that it's not that terribly difficult for a researcher like Billy Ross uh, to get a hand on one of these controllers. Also, pacemakers themselves aren't all that picky. They will accept commands from pretty much any compatible controller. And apparently hospitals in Australia had uh, problems earlier this week, not as a result of ransomware, but as a result of patching, showing that, well, uh, patching, while we always want to do it, it's not always that straightforward. Apparently, some doctors were no longer able to log in to systems after the patch was applied. Not really clear what exactly was going on here. I'll link to the Australian newspaper that sort of covered this story, but uh, there's a lot of politics in there, so really hard to tell what's real and what actually happened in this particular case. Well, and it's a Friday, so I got with me here another STI student to talk about uh, his uh, recent uh, research. Got with me here, uh, Jeremiah. So Jeremiah, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So my name's Jeremiah Hanley. I'm recording from Hershey, Pennsylvania. 
Uh, so I work for the Hershey Company. I'm a blue team member on that team. And I have about one year experience in the Sands Masters program so far. Okay, so still pretty new, but protecting chocolate, so protecting is something really important there. Yeah, that, uh, Absolutely, that works, right? to protect the good stuff. <laughs> yeah, so uh, anyway, so your paper was about automating the critical controls, and that's always something that sort of I'm pushing for, and I keep saying in my classes that security is good if it's boring, essentially. If you can automate a lot of this stuff, it also kind of shows that you have control over your process in some way. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about uh, how you went about automating some of the critical controls? Yeah, absolutely. So my paper was called Auto Nuke It from Orbit, a framework for critical security control automation. So in the paper, I started with a problem. That problem was that I had many manual tasks that were performed by our security team that I wanted to get into an automated state. However, we didn't have any sort of method for prioritizing and executing on the development of that automation. So in my paper, I attempted to offer a solution to first prioritize identified tasks using a combination of skills analysis, resource analysis, and as you said, the uh, CIS critical security controls. So then I moved on to offer a solution to both plan and execute the development and implementation of automation software. And throughout the paper, I use the example of an automation script to re-image an infected workstation, which I use the term nuke it from orbit. So if anybody's ever heard of the movie Aliens, uh, you'll recognize that from Ripley whenever she's trying to completely wipe out the alien race. Yeah, now uh, the nuke it from orbit, of course, is sort of the standard uh, technique how you recover a, a, a compromised workstation or server. Uh, what kind of tools did you find using uh, when uh, you uh, implemented some of these automation uh, processes? So the majority of the code is developed in Python. And the Python script is accessing the APIs for multiple security products that are pretty well known. So we have Splunk in there. We have ServiceNow for ticketing, and we have Semantic Endpoint Protection, which was the endpoint solution that I had available for actually quarantining a device before it got re-imaged. And then lastly, we just sent an email to the user saying, hey, you're about to get kicked off the network, heads up. Uh, you should get contacted pretty soon here to figure out how you can get back on. Now, uh, one thing that I've seen a lot lately uh, with security tools is that people tell me they don't buy a tool for particular features it offers, but they buy a tool for its API. Uh, how well did you find these APIs to be documented in the tools that you were using? So some of the APIs were phenomenal, others not so much. Uh, so some companies love to publicize their APIs online, have beautiful documentation. Others, you actually have to install the product before you even get any sort of documentation. And by that time, you're reading through uh, pretty much pseudocode of their API, trying to, to really uh, be in a trial by fire. So easy some spots, not so easy in others. Yeah, that's uh, sort of what I found a little bit. Now, uh, when you buy new tools these days, uh, do you look for an API uh, before you sort of decide a tool? Like, is this one of the things that you're uh, checking? Yeah, that's actually been a very common question now in our vendor meeting. So mm -hmm. anytime that we're looking at a new product, that's one, definitely one of the questions that comes up from our entire team. And I've sometimes uh, also heard this being referred to sort of as security orchestration, where you basically have a software that really ties together all of these different APIs. Have you looked at any commercial products? Have you actually seen anything that sort of does that commercially? Yeah, so since this script actually used ServiceNow, ServiceNow actually has a orchestration module that we're looking into um, that we really think that we can start leveraging for uh, integration for any sort of incident response in the future. Now, uh, your particular project there was incident response. Uh, what about some of the other credit controls, like you know, inventory is usually one of these things that uh, people are always threatening and are really it's really hard to get good at inventory in an enterprise. Um, any ideas uh, if a similar model could be used there? Yeah, definitely could. In terms of prioritization, obviously it's the number one critical security control, so it definitely falls uh, in line with 
the prioritization model. But whenever it comes down to it, if you don't have the, the people resources or the technology resources, you're still going to struggle. So once, once you can identify those additional resources, I think that it can definitely fall into a, a high priority for any company. Yeah, now uh, one thing I always find uh, when I do you know, automation like this is that uh, my process originally wasn't really defined all, as well as I thought it was defined. And, uh, you know, of course, when you then try to script it, uh, then it becomes evident that uh, certain decisions you, know, you, you haven't really uh, thought about in the beginning. Uh, any issues like this that you ran into? Yeah, absolutely. So planning is definitely something that uh, technologists hate to do. I hate doing it myself. However, in this paper, I actually identify a uh, crawl, walk, run approach. So start with uh, planning out what phases that you're going to execute throughout the development of the automation script. Um, get to a crawling point just so that something's working. Once you're, you're crawling and uh, have the outline of a script, you can move into the walk phase where you're going to try and uh, get the full functionality of what you originally identified. And then moving forward, you can move into a run stage where you're doing future development, making enhancements that you never thought possible in the beginning, and maybe identify it along the path of development. And was it relatively easy to sort of get management buy-in for that, uh, given that it's probably a big time saver to do that, right? Yeah, it's actually a huge topic right now in my company, and uh, I've heard from many of my peer groups that their companies are very interested in automation. So there's a huge buy-in right now, uh, I think industry-wide. Yeah, everybody's complaining about not being able to hire, and if you can replace people with scripts, you know, that's of course always quite attractive. <laughs> yeah, so I wouldn't say that it's always replacing people with scripts. I would actually argue that it's more freeing up your time to be able to do a, a higher level of work. Um, so if you're not doing these manual processes that maybe take up 10 to 15 hours of your week, uh, now you can move on to some higher level thinking, some more strategy, uh, and and really take your security uh, maturity to the next level. Yeah, that's exactly sort of what I find too, is you don't really want to be sitting there doing the same thing over and over. Uh, kind of you know, rather write a script than beat a script, so to speak. Exactly. Yeah. Um, now, what's next for you? Are you working on any other projects like this? or? So I haven't committed to any particular topics yet, but I do have a special interest in data science right now. So I'm still exploring that field and exploring potential integrations between security, automation, data science for any sort of future research. So stay tuned. Okay. Yeah, thanks and uh, good for, to have you here, Jeremiah, and uh, good luck uh, with your future here at SDI. This was uh, Jeremiah Heinley. You can find his uh, paper in the SANS uh, EDU uh, research uh, section. So uh, take a look and any feedback, welcome. And thanks again for listening. And as a reminder, Monday will be Memorial Day here in the US. So the next podcast will be Tuesday. So talk to you again on Tuesday. Bye.